Welcome to The Breakdown with Broadco and Becky, a weekly podcast that breaks down politics, policy, and current affairs. I'm Michael Broadcorp. And I'm Becky Scher. It's a busy season for The Breakdown as we work to bring you regularly scheduled content and cover all things surrounding the race for president. Today, we're bringing things back to Minnesota with our guest, Shannon Watson. Shannon Watson is the founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization called Majority in the Middle. Shannon has spent more than 20 years working in politics and advised candidates and worked on campaigns across the political spectrums in Kansas, Colorado, and Minnesota. And she has worked for various organizations more in the policy arena. She's also a recognized speaker and op-ed writer, focusing on topics like division in society and bipartisan advocacy. With Shannon, we will break down what Majority in the Middle is and what they've been working on since their inception. We will break down their goals for the future and what they aim to accomplish. And we will break down a recent Majority in the Middle report called The State of Bipartisanship, which hits on both challenges and successes in fostering collaborative governance. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the show. We are pleased to be joined today by Shannon Watson of Majority in the Middle. Shannon, why don't we just kick things off by talking a little bit about how you came to find Majority in the Middle and elaborate a little bit on your mission and how it aligns with your vision for inclusive policymaking. Awesome. Um, Well, I come to this work very naturally. Uh, My dad is a Republican. Um, what I've, what I've started calling a legacy Republican because he's been a Republican for a very long time. Um, and my mom is a Democrat or a libertarian, depending on the day and the issue, because she is from rural Kansas and all the Kansans, no matter where they are, uh, with party ID, all have sort of a libertarian streak to them. So I literally learned bipartisanship growing up at the dinner table. We got all the lit, Um, we got all the door knockers, you know, voting as soon as you're 18 was a given. And so this idea that, um, you know, people can't be in relationship with somebody that if that you're of different political parties, that's enormously foreign to me because I have watched it, you know, every day of my life and they're going on now 53, 54 years of marriage, uh, 54 years in June. And so they have made it work. So there's the, the, this idea that you can't and people don't want to, um, that was that was weird for me. But the sort of the impetus to putting the organization together um, was the first, uh, first presidential debate between uh, then President Trump and then candidate Biden. Um, and I didn't, I didn't watch that debate. I didn't need to. It wasn't going to change my vote. It was, all it was just going to do was annoy me. Um, but I watched social media and I watched social media like right afterwards and in the, in the following days. And the thing I noticed, I mean, I expected some of it, you know, the right doubling down, their guy was great. The left doubling down, their guy was great. Um, or, you know, the doubling down that, you know, their guy was fine and, and everybody, everybody else's guy was terrible. Um, but the number of people who I consider to be very political people, so like you all would be in this circle, you know, you've you've, you've staffed campaigns, you've worked for parties, you've been in elected office, you you know, you've you've done all the political things. But the number of people who I knew were just like, this is gross. I'm out. Like the number of people in the middle who have been opting out has worried me for years. And when we finally got to this sort of really entrenched class of people saying, nope, this is enough. I was like, okay, we got to, we got to do something. Um, so the, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what we're going to do. I, you know, I'm a convener. And so I was like, let's, let's figure this out. And we put a brand on it and, um, we've been working on it for about four years. And our goal is, is politics we can be proud of. So that's kind of the origin story. I'm a huge fan of this. And we have been, we've wanted to have you on for a, quite some time to talk a huge advocate of this majority in the, in the middle concept and doing it. A lot of what Becky and I believe in on this show, we're Mm -hmm. both from partisan perspectives, both Republicans, but we try to have a safe space for discussions. We've had Democrats and Republicans on. We're trying to raise kind of the civil discussion. And when you were talking about the presidential debate, I just wanted to share a little bit of a personal story. I grew up in a very apolitical household in the sense that my parents voted but politics just wasn't a, a real discussion item. And so I'm married and I have three kids. And 
people would probably expect based on my partisan background that I'm having them study Lee Atwater or go <laughs> Ronald Reagan or other types of stuff. Or It's not anywhere remotely true. I've, my wife and I have tried to raise the civic IQ of our children. Yeah. So we've, we had them watch the presidential debates. We encourage them. We have discussions, not necessarily to indoctrinate them into one political party or another, just to vet out where they are on issues and explain them, just to raise their civic, civic IQ. But when you were talking about the presidential debates, I've said to my kids a number of times how, how disappointed I am that they're growing up in this type of political environment where they're seeing this level of partisanship. And it's been yeah. challenging um, because I, politics is such a passion of mine and civic engagement is such a passion of mine that what they're seeing, what gets on TV is a lot of this drama, this hyper-partisanship. And it's just a challenging time. So I just wanted to ref- just to acknowledge that where you started is just really important. And as someone as a parent who's trying to bring his children up in this environment and want them to be able to have discussions, examine issues from both perspectives and have responsible discussions, what we're seeing at the national level doesn't lend itself to that. And that's part of the reason why the timing of this interview is so good, because what we're seeing at the national stage is somewhat frustrating, I think. Again, I don't speak for Becky, but where this race on the Republican side is trending and what's setting up this cycle, what could potentially be the presidential race, is, I think, going to be frustrating to some people. And so having you on and talk about majority in the middle and the work you're doing and having politics we can be proud of is just the timing of it is really good. So I thank you for doing that. And thank you for what you started. And thank you for being here today. Absolutely. Now, I kind of always look at politics as as a pendulum, right? The elections, mm-hmm. every time, you know, you swing left and then there's the response and it swings right and we kind of get this back and forth. And I feel like we're in a kind of new space where there is so many of there are so many of those folks in the middle who really believe they're the Democrats have gone too far left. The Republicans have gone too far right. Now they might still identify like myself and Michael with a with a party, mm-hmm. um, but find themselves in the middle. What is majority in the middle doing? What kind of strategies are you employing to kind of speak to those people, reach those people, and help bridge that gap from folks who may align with a party or the middle, but kind of find themselves a little on, you know, in no man's land a little bit? Yeah. So the first thing I'll do is define how we we use the term the middle. So for some people, the middle may may be very moderate. Uh, It may be, you know, you just, you're, you're on your whichever side you're on, but you consider yourself a moderate. It could be um, people like myself who come to the table with agreeing with some issues on the left and some issues on the right. And so um, I, uh, I, I always, I always try to spin to the positive. Uh, So instead of saying, I don't, I don't belong on either team, I say I belong on both teams. Um, And which can be very uncomfortable. Or um, we have a lot of people who are very entrenched in their beliefs uh, but believe that the collaboration and compromise and sort of working across those divisions um, is an essential part of governing, not necessarily a part of campaigning, but it's part of governing. Um, and so anybody who comes to the table in good faith and wants to participate with us, we welcome with open arms. Um, I would say like we've got we've got tactical things. So like we, you know, host events and we do this report at the legislature. Um, but the main thing we're really doing is encouraging relationships because um, uh, somebody, and I don't know where this, where this originally came from, but uh, somebody said to me, you know, it's hard to hate up close. And that's absolutely right. true. And the, if you have a relationship with somebody that you don't politically agree with, um, your relationship with them can sort of withstand that, that political difference. And it can be okay. Um, and that's that's what we've gotten away from. I mean, you know, we can, when we have relationships with people we disagree with on religion or politics or football teams or sandwich toppings, you know, whatever it is, if you have that relationship, then that just becomes, well, that's my friend who we happen to disagree on this. Not that it needs to, our relationship needs to end because of that disagreement. So that's really, I mean, we're, we're encouraging some relationships. Completely understand Michael and I um, had a longstanding food fight. And so if our relationship can withstand all of that disagreement, I mean, there's hope for everybody. There you go. Even when your takes are that bad. Uh, Apparently. (laughs) 
And the other point I'd make is, speaking of football, I'm married to a Packers fan, mm -hmm. um, which is really frustrating. Uh, Becky is also married to a Packers fan. It's true. Yeah. See, there you go. If you can get over that, we but should I, be able to give over the politics. Absolutely. That's right. I will say, just in the interest of disclosure, that uh, even though I'm married to a Packers fan, uh, I did buy Vikings license plates, which just came in the mail. So now she has to drive a vehicle that has Viking license plate on it. So... <laughs> Uh, it's really you, good. You, did, you didn't go blackout like Governor Walls? Nope, nope. I went full on <laughs> partisanship and didn't even run a buyer. So I uh, went right with the Vikings team. So awesome. But I think that's completely right. I mean, we see this all the time with, with social media, especially, you know, with folks sitting behind, you know, in their own homes, on their phone or on their computers and being willing to say things on social media to elected officials or to other people they disagree with yeah. that they would never say face to face. I mean, there it, it certainly, while there's a lot of benefits, obviously, to social media, it's, it's certainly one of the downfalls that we've seen is that kind of ability to just you know, rail into each other. So with some of these folks, you talked about relationship building. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of things are you encouraging to, to kind of foster that participation and build those relationships from folks who may already kind of feel alienated from one of the two parties or from their elected officials? Um, there are a couple of things. And I have a I have a, a talk that I've, I've been uh, going around to chambers and rotaries. Um, and it's it's called Why We're Divided and What You Can Do About It. And it's like there's there's very little politics in it. Most of it has to do with just identifying the things about your relationship that that you can that you can get along about. And, the, you know, like there are organizations out there like Braver Angels um, has uh, has a great track record of teaching people how to talk about political issues across a divide. And because that is that is a skill to to do that in a way that that doesn't escalate. Um, they're great at doing that. And if people want to do that, I highly encourage, you know, go take their training. It's awesome. And most people in the middle um, who have sort of opted out of politics, because that's part of the I, part of the challenge. Like, I think we seem really polarized right now because it's the loudest voices on the edges that are talking. And yeah. The middle has just opted out of the conversation. And part of the challenge for the last couple of years is that the politics has has left the political arena and has come to sit in our workplaces and our civic organizations and our schools in ways it hasn't before. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, how do I deal with it? Like, I've never had to deal with everybody's political affiliation at work and how that, you know, affects my relationship with Andy from accounting. I mean, you know, th that's one of the reasons that the business community, I've, I've worked a lot with the business community at the chamber. And, you know, Business people generally don't understand politics because they they don't have the luxury of being able to say, well, I don't agree with half of these coworkers, so I'm just not gonna. Or, you know, taking to Twitter to say what a terrible person Andy from accounting is. So yep. like it it's weird for them that this is sort of the universe that people exist in. And then that universe comes and shows up in their space. Um so just like engaging in the ways that they want to. I will say one of the things that I think we absolutely have to do is get the middle back engaged in those political conversations. They need to vote in the primaries. They need to show up to caucuses and conventions. But I will say like I can't in good conscience right now tell people who really don't like the state of our politics, who think it's ugly and it's awful and whatever like I'm like, yeah, go to precinct caucus on February 27th and spend two hours of your life getting the exact experience that you've been running away from. You know, like I can't in good conscience until I can get sort of a critical mass of people to go do that together. Um, so that's that's part of the thing is just like, let's identify what is political and what needs to be political and then what isn't and leave it, put that back in its own arena. You know, it's fascinating because... It seems so simple, right? Just like yeah. people should be able to have conversations at a civil level and and walk away from that, you know, without throwing throwing blows at each other mm -hmm. or, or, you know, verbal or physical, whatever it might be. But it is sad. I mean, that is the state of where we are, that there are so many people that um, just can't have those civil conversations and understand that. Uh, and again, this is a big thing that we have worked to 
worked on Mm -hmm. with, with our podcast is that you can disagree without being disagreeable. I personally have found that sometimes, um, you know, especially when I was a really, really, you know, diehard start strict partisan, um, that sometimes having those conversations across the aisle or with folks who disagree with me is how I strengthened my own views and my own opinions and my ways of, of wanting to relay your message on a topic itself. So I think it is something that people are really missing out on. Um, because again, it's not meaning that you have to walk away from that agreeing on anything. You you could either even strengthen your own opinion, but having those conversations and, and again, just learning and being exposed and, and bringing those that middle back into the fold is something I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can engage more of. I, I'm not sure that that's going to happen here leading up to the 2024 election, unfortunately, but I am hopeful. Um, I would like to hear from you a little bit of looking forward. Um, what Minnesota, you know, we're going to get into the report and the breakdown of that mm-hmm. and an upcoming event that you guys have, but want to speak a little bit to um, kind of the work you have done. If there's anything, um, you know, you want to point to successes uh, that Minnesota, or I'm sorry, majority in the middle has, um, has found already and kind of what are the key goals and objectives you have for the near future? Um, that's kind of a hard one. So um, one of the things that we did this year, uh, this past year in 2023, is we did what we call just multi, multi-partisan socials, just were an opportunity for people who um, were from whatever spot on the political spectrum you are, um, to come and sit down and chat. And we targeted the 17 uh, split districts in the state to do that. And the split districts are the ones where the, you know, the senator and the representative are of different political parties. Um, and we, we did that for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it was just sort of easy to, to you know, just for us to sort of keep the balance and so it's, you know, why aren't you, why are you in a Democrat district? Why are you in a Republican district? It's well, we're in both people's districts. Um, and I will say we like, we didn't get to all 17. I wish we had, but we hadn't, we got to 11. And, um, by the end of that series, um, we were able to, um, get the, the legislators in that, that sort of home district, both to come to the event. And I think. Um, you know, cause like we had legislators at every single one of our events. Um, but there was still some hesitancy and it's, you know, our brand is new. We've only been around since 2020. Um, and people are really hesitant to like, what are you going to walk into? Um, and that's attendees and legislators and, you know, me and media and all other people. Um, so being able to sort of set a standard that this is going to be a civil conversation sort of no matter what, um, I think generally people who uh, come to our events, they're opting into our idea. They sort of already agree with us. They may not agree with everybody on on the political issues, but they agree like we need to do something and we need to sort of cross that divide. So we haven't had to kick anybody out yet. Um, we, we've only had one sort of heated discussion. And honestly, that was up on the Iron Range. And so that was just, you know, a function of being on the Iron Range. Uh, that's how people talk to each other. Um, so I think the just the next pieces um, have have to do with sort of more of the same and letting people in the middle know like you you need to get back engaged and there is a function to do that and it's it's not as scary as you think. I'd like to ask you about social media for a second because one yeah. of the things that I believe is one of the biggest drivers of partisanship is social media and. Mm-hmm. What I think it's done, and I started using Twitter in 2008. I've always been a big advocate of social media. But one of my kind of ground rules for using social media was I would never say something to someone on social media, but I wouldn't say to them in person. And so that's always framed up my discussions. And so it's also, though, most people don't, I I don't, I question whether a lot of people have that same rule and, and that concept. But what I think it has done is it just, it elevates the rhetoric to such a severe level. It makes it difficult for when you meet people then to have civil conversations because you've been a little bit on both sides. There's a little bit of keyboard warriors in the back to just escalate the tension to such a level. And I think social media has an impact that. And I wanted to get your your perspective on Shannon, your perspective a little bit on social media and how it, in your mind, how it is is played into this kind of rise of partisanship. Yeah. Um... I would say like you're you're in the minority if if the only things you're type the piece you would say 
to somebody's face because a lot of people like Becky alluded to, like they take that a step further and they will say, they will type things that they won't say out loud. Um, and I think some of the anonymity, um, just of just, we're not in the same proximity to people. Um, and then of course there's, there's people who use avatars and like fake names and, and whatever to sort of hide their, their persona behind whatever. Um, and I think there's the tone of social media. I mean, in the same way, like the tone of an email, you can, you can sort of get off of, of what the intended tone is supposed to be like any sort of written communication. You don't necessarily know if you do, there's no inflection. There's no, there's no, you know, just the way your voice goes up and down. Um, so I think that's an issue, but I think the the main thing is just, we don't have the, so like I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about Pat Garofalo and Ryan Winkler and their sort of Twitter fights, quote unquote, over the, over the years. And Ryan and Pat, like, if you know them in person, like, you know, they had, they had a good relationship that allowed them to be a little bit antagonistic on Twitter, but people who don't know them just think these guys fight all the time, you know? And so people who like see, Pat Garofalo and Ryan Winkler as leaders, they're elected, they're leaders. Um, it's, well, this is, this is how, this is how we're going to con, you know, have conduct, um, online is that we can just zing each other and this is okay because this is what our leaders are doing. And so I think that's one of the challenges is that we have just decided that zinging each other is a, an acceptable form of personal communication. And it's not like, it's, it's fine if it's your friend. But it's not if you don't, if you're not, if you don't have, you know, the other 99% of the context that isn't on Twitter, I think that's, that's one of the challenges. And then it's just like, I mean, going on with that, like the, the sort of societal acceptance of like shouting at people at school board meetings, you know, it used to be like somebody would stand up and shout at things. Like everybody else would sort of sit back and murmur and like, oh, look, this person is shot and that's terrible, whatever. Now they get applause. Anything that is rewarded will will be repeated. Yeah. So million dollar question here yeah. <laughs> is how do we change things? You know, what steps do you believe individuals, communities, leaders, elected and, and otherwise – can take to, to reduce some of that divisiveness and promote some more constructive political dialogue, both on social media and in person um, and in our everyday? That is the million dollar question. <laughs> and if somebody has a million dollars to help me figure that out, that would be lovely. Um, send, I will send you my bank account number because um, that would be great. Uh, so, so we sort of organize our work in sort of three ways. Um, the first is that we give people in the middle a space to engage. Um, sort of be that that good reentry point, um, and I think people getting back engaged is is a huge part of it. Um, the second piece is elevating the behavior that we want to see, um, and amplifying the voices of people who are who are modeling that behavior. Um, with human beings, carrots are always more effective than sticks in changing human behavior, and um, so like the 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 tendency in politics that you know, it's the people who say outlandish things who get the most press and who get the most clicks, you know, why aren't we elevating the people who are doing it right? And so that's one of the things that, that we're trying to do that hopefully there will be an incentive for people to, to conduct themselves sort of better because they will get, they will get positive attention for it. It won't just be like, Oh, okay. You know, and granted that should be the baseline. That should be boring, but you know, I'll tell you like right now it's news when people get along. It was news, you know, um, when Jeremy Miller, he released his, um, his uh, uh, sports betting bill. And like in the, in the article that I read, uh, Senator Klein said, you know, he so appreciated Senator Miller, like giving him a heads up that, that he's introducing this bill. And this is a great start for the negotiations. Like that should be normal, but it isn't. To the point, the Senator Klein thought to tell a reporter that he really appreciated that that piece. Um, so, like those kind of things are the things that that we should be doing. Um, and then the other piece is um, is sort of the the structural, what I call the structural partisanship. 
So there's a couple of, of different facets to this. The first piece is, you know, in legislative bodies that are designed to be partisan, meant to be partisan. How are we getting in the way of, of that relationship building? So like where they have their offices, having offices on different floors and different wings keeps people artificially separated or like sitting on opposite sides of the committee table. Um, you know, it keeps people separated. It keeps them in really sort of antagonistic kind of places where, you know, you don't like, I mean, think about people that you would share space with at work. You know, you see the pictures on their desk. You see, like if somebody gets a flower delivery, either something really good or really bad has happened. Like those kind of things. You get to know them as people. You stand in line to use the microwave at lunch. Those are just relationship building blocks, really basic, really small things um, that when we keep people artificially separated, you lose. Um, So there's that piece. And then there's the piece of um, keeping nonpartisan offices actually nonpartisan um, and, and, and keeping, you know, sort of different levels of government in their own lane. Um, and there's sort of a timely example there, but I'll let that one go for right now. <laughs> well, I want to jump into the state of the bipartisan bipartisanship report. Yes. Um, before so, the, I just want to kind of question or ask about a follow up of what you were just explaining about promoting folks who are doing this, who are doing good. Do you yeah. think it is difficult? You know, I feel like with everybody's starting from this place of division, right? So let's say majority in the middle promoted Pat Garofalo for doing stuff. Are you then going to have folks on the other side saying, whoa, 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 are you now Republican or vice versa? You promote Ryan Winkler. Are you seeing any of that? Are people kind of taking you at your word for what you're standing for and understanding that you are going to be promoting folks on both sides of the aisle doing good in this way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say my experience having some views from the right and some views on the left and being on both people's teams or both, you know, sort of both sides teams. Um, I have been used to people in partisan spaces really distrusting me for a very long time. Um, because this idea that if you're not with us, you're against us is so like, that's, that's such a thing. If you're not with us, you're against us. Well, what if I'm with you and I'm with that? Like, and they're like, Oh no, you can't do that. Yes, I can. And so, um, so yeah, I get some of that, the, the, you know, oh, okay, well you're, you know, elevating a Republican. So you must be, no, that's, that's not it. And, you know, give me a minute and I'll prove it to you. But also like, just for me personally, like just because somebody says I am something doesn't make it so, and it, it doesn't bug me. That being said, I will say like, like I think about it and I weigh it in my head and my own um, New Year's resolution is to not get fear, not to let fear get in the way of saying the quiet part out loud, because that's that's one of the pieces that, you know, it, like, I know, like, OK, people are going to say that. And at the same time, that doesn't make it true. So that's that's kind of the, the thing I have to remind myself. I that's love great. that. That's yeah. a great New Year's resolution. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I want to get into, so uh, Majority in the Middle recently conducted a report on state of bipartisanship. Bip- Man, I'm going to struggle today. <laughs> state of bipartisanship yes. um, when it comes to um, bill authorship here in the Minnesota legislature. Um, I want to start just by a little anecdote. I, I spent three years working for Congressman Emmer in Washington, D.C., and um Anybody who's ever written or done comms work for an elected or candidate knows that there's, you know, certain idiosyncrasies of how they like things, words they like or don't like. Um, Emmer was not a fan of the word bipartisanship because he thought that that made folks automatically read it as if there's just two sides and automatically view it as the division. He preferred to call it, say those things were nonpartisan. Because, you know, that kind of just starts at an even playing field. And I always kind of enjoyed that that take from him. Um, you know, I'm not sure if if that changes in new comms people write bipartisan. But um, I, I thought that was an interesting little tidbit of, of who Emmer was and, and how he looked at his messaging around things. Um, but this report. Very fascinating. I want to chat a little bit about how you came to put together this report and focusing on bill authorship, authorships as kind of the key metric for breaking down bipartisanship in the Minnesota legislature. So um, 
there's there's that idea at in the Minnesota legislature that if you're in the minority, no matter which party you're in, whichever chamber you're in, um, if you're in the minority, you can't even get your bill heard. You know, that that goes around. And, you know, there's a DFL trifecta right now, but this is the only 2024 will be only the fourth trifecta year and the last 31 years of the state legislature. So having trifectas is actually not usual uh, in Minnesota. So somebody had asked me um, beginning of this session, like, hey, is that is that thing about you can't get your bill heard? Like, is that true? And I said, well, I mean, I don't know. Like, I know people who have gotten bills enacted from the minority. Like, so no, it's not 100% true. But at the same time, is it st- statistically significant? Well, probably no. I don't know. And nobody had ever counted. Um, and so we decided to count. And so we just started a tally of each of the bills that were getting hearings um, in each of the committees. And I will say, in retrospect, this was a terrible year to start this project because there were so many bills. Like we we did not anticipate this uh, in February when we started this. So we just started, started, you know, red, blue, red, blue. And the thing that we realized really fast was that um, you know, who the chief author of a bill is doesn't tell the entire story. And there's often a lot of nuance and strategy into who the chief author is, but also who else is on the bill. And so we went back and started calculating, keeping track of the total authorship of the bill at the time of hearing. And so um, instead of just a red blue scale, that's where we wound up with the red blue purple scale um, and different shades of purple, you know. Uh, and, and what we found was that there was a lot more bipartisan bills getting hearings than you'd think, um, a lot more bipartisanship than, than you would assume, uh, based on final votes and talking points and all those other things. This is an amazing piece of work. I, in prep for this interview, read and reviewed it. I want to just point out it's 315 pages. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, Becky is a big nerd. And this is like a nerd Bible. This is just fantastic. <laughs> the amount of detail that went into this report, it is just an impressive document and an impressive report. So my Thank hat's you. off to you and, and everyone else involved in the preparation of this, because if it's if it is one thing, it is certainly detailed. 315 pages. Yeah. Uh, and it was just an impressive body of work and incredibly insightful and incredibly interesting to read and to look at the amount of the amount of time and effort that went into preparing it a very user friendly very easy to follow and just a very insightful and i know you picked a tough year to start it mm-hmm. but is this something you're going to do on a regular basis yes we are going to try to do this every year you know stir on again you know sony guys got a million dollars send it my way um <laughs> yeah and cuz we knew that the the first the first question that was that came up when we got done um, was, well, how does this compare to past years? And because because we're doing um, author total authorship at the time of hearing, you got to do it by hand. Now, the individual legislators piece, um, we were able to. I had somebody write me a computer program that basically scraped the uh, revisor's office data, um, but we had to do those pieces by hand because those things changed throughout the throughout the session. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just, uh, one of the things that we didn't do is we didn't tell anybody that we were doing it while we were doing it. Um, oh, that's interesting. We wanted, yeah. We wanted one baseline year of, of this is what this looks like just sort of without anybody paying attention to it because, you know, anything that what, what gets measured gets managed. And so now that people are counting, um, actually, uh, one of my lobbyist friends said this to me the other day, she said something about. Um, it was just sort of in passing. She's like, yeah, I, you know, somebody said something about this to me. And she's like, every time somebody files a bill this year, they're going to be thinking about your report. And initially I was like, I'm really glad you guys aren't uh, doing the, the <laughs> video of this, but like, like the shock on my face. And she's like, you didn't think about that. I was like, no, I mean, it's one, uh, it one thing like, wow, that's great. We got 201 legislators. Every time they file something, they think about how this is going to look in the report. In in some ways that's great, and in some ways it was like really scary, um, because we know we're affecting behavior, and so we anticipate, you know, because we'll we'll do for for twenty twenty four, 
we anticipate it and it's it's not it's not a um it's not a scorecard because bipartisanship is enormously nuanced it has a lot to do with relationships and tone and conduct and this was the one thing we could count this was the one objective thing that we could count and so we did and so i expect some people will have more bipartisan authorship of their bills because they know it's going to be in this report. I also know there are going to be legislators who have less bipartisan authorship because they know it's going to be in the report because in not all of the districts, bipartisanship is, it's not always rewarded by the electorate. I mean, there are plenty of people who expect this from elected officials. Uh, unfortunately, they're not always the people who go to the endorsing conventions. And that's something that I find to be so frustrating about politics because I truly believe what you're, what Shannon, what you're doing is where most people are. It, mm-hmm. These type of discussions, and what Becky are trying to, and I are trying to do on this podcast, we're trying to have civil discussions with people, even when we disagree with them on policy, yeah. is where most people are. But for some reason, the train is driven by some hyperpartisans, and that's what's so frustrating. Sometimes is that in my heart, I know that this is this type of work product is where Minnesotans want to be. They want a functioning. They want a functioning government. They want a government that works in a collaborative way, that gets their business done on time, and and understands that both sides get to have some give and take. But it just seems this exercise is just a reminder of the who's driving the train sometimes and how frustrating it is in that instance. Yeah, absolutely. And the the you know decisions are made by people who show up. And so if you have 112 people who are at your making decisions at your endorsing convention, or you have you know 9,000 people who vote in your primary, like those are the people who are making those decisions. And if a lot of us are just opting out and waiting for the, you know, waiting for our ballot in November, and then we're going to pick between, you know, the, the lesser of two evils, like that's, that's part of the challenge. And, and I, I don't, um, I don't fault legislators for, for, for doing what they need to do, because number one, if you had to reapply for your job every two years, like that's hard. Having 86,000 bosses is hard. And so, you know, we all naturally, we, we respond to the people that, that interact with us. Um, that's one of the reasons, like I tell people, I tell, you know, quote unquote, normal people, like send your, send your elected official an email and it doesn't have to be like, you don't, it doesn't matter that you're say, hi, I'm a constituent just wanted to say hello, you will get an answer to this email because they almost never get them. Correct. And, and then, because then that that's also, it's, it's enhancing the relationship because then when you're somebody who, who wants to weigh in on a bill or something on the agenda, or you have a problem or whatever, then you're already a known quantity to the elected official. And you're not just quote unquote person with a problem. Um, so I think the, the more, those things can be, and like, if you know your state representative or your state senator, you're much more likely to go to that convention and support them or engage in the, in their campaigns and support them if you need to. Um, it's just when everybody's just nameless, faceless suits at the Capitol, um, it's just, it's easier to disconnect and think that it doesn't, your, you know, your involvement doesn't matter, but it absolutely does. We spoke on a recent episode about the politics of politics, and I think that's kind of that certainly comes to play when it comes to bill authorship, but both in the legislature and Congress, everything in between. Um, And as you said, you know, authorship sometimes, you know, certainly doesn't tell the whole story, especially, you know, I I don't know if things have changed since I've worked at the Senate, but uh, as somebody who is the chief author, they get to shop that around, right? They get to go find their four or five, however, whatever the limit is at, at the Senate. And so they get to use that as an opportunity to to make um a statement of sorts if 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 they want to not always sometimes yeah. they they just introduce it and other people can ask to sign on but very often there is you know that decision do i want a democrat if i'm a republican chief mm-hmm. author do i want a democrat on here do i want to load it up with strong republicans who do i want half and half do i want all democrats and that's something that i think over the years we've seen be used both ways right we hear you see yeah. all of these political ads that, you know, I remember I worked on the McFadden campaign in 14 and, you know, Franken voted 97% of the time with President Obama. So we, we highlighted that side of things. But then you also see when somebody will, you know, if at an endorsing convention or something, they will say, you know, Joe Schmo Republican voted 90 or, you know, 
42% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. And again, those don't tell the whole story. So it is hard to kind of navigate through what even true bipartisanship means um, and, and what we can lift up because there is always, unfortunately, a political angle. I, I, like you said, they're running every two years. They always, you know, in, in 2023, they have to know that every bill that they either author or the chief author or co-sponsor on could potentially come back and say, you're working too much with this guy on the other side of the aisle. You're not Republican enough for us. And it's frustrating that that benchmark stands. But I think that this is a good way to break down some of those nuances of what we're actually looking at. And um, so I wanted to catch from you uh, because I was, I have my maybe surprise, something that surprised me a little bit, but what was your biggest surprise finding as you were going through this process and, and analyzing the results? I think there were two things. Um, the first one, what, and actually I'm going to pause on that. One of the things that we didn't have in the report, um, mainly because we we're having to do this by hand, was uh, how the actual vote totals came down. Um, and people asked us a lot about that. And in this era of omnibus bills, like if you have standalone bills, there were a lot of standalone bills that went through this year with a lot of bipartisan support, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that to look at, you know, like the budget bills that are, that are, you know, just everything sort of lumped together. Um, to your point about the, you know, what's going to come back to haunt them, you know, people will often not vote against a bill or they won't vote for a bill based on the good stuff. They'll vote against it because of the bad stuff. Um, and, you know, good and bad are obviously subjective terms. But so I would say the the two things that surprised me the most about the report, the first one was how much purple there actually was. Like, I knew there was going to be some. I didn't expect nearly as much as there as there was. Um, and then the other thing that surprised me um, that maybe shouldn't have, I don't know, uh, was the amount of power that committee chairs have to shape these kind of things. So I was sitting in Senate Tax Committee, I think it was the first or second hearing this year, and Senator Rest, who is the chair of the Tax Committee, she said, we are going to be hearing uh, DFL bills. We're going to be hearing Republican bills. We're going to be hearing bipartisan bills. I said, what I will not do is if your bill has five authors of the same party, I'm not going to hear your bill. Now, she would accept four authors of the same party and a space. So like uh, Gary Carlson and I both like flagged this and put it out on Twitter. And then there was like this big hubbub because people were like, oh, she's giving Republicans, you know, veto power over the entire agenda. And it was like, no, that's that's not what's happening. Um, but like in that, that's what I would call structural bipartisanship and bringing people together, like the presence of both parties on your bill makes that more attractive to a committee chair. Um, you know, the House veterans and uh, veterans and military, like that committee has always been super bipartisan, mainly because they, you know, they like make that a, a, a piece of, of, of being in the committee. Um, uh, Senate uh, Human Services Committee, like, that has a lot to do with Senator Hoffman and Senator Abler's relationship and their commitment that a lot of stuff that goes on in that committee shouldn't be partisan. And so there was an enormous amount of, of bipartisan support in, in those committees. And it, like, it just, it illustrates that not everything there is top down. I mean, committee chairs are top of something, but like, it's not just the triumphant handing down what's going to happen. A lot of people have a lot of power to, to do these things. Um, you mentioned Senator Ann Rest. We, we yes. spoke about her and her conference committee. Um, you know, she had some lively comments during that procedure yes. as well or process. Um, and that actually is one of the things that surprised me. So one of the breakdowns were um, that certain Senate committees had notable levels of bipartisanship. Mm -hmm. Transportation did not surprise me. Transportation committee, highest proportion of bills were with minority chief authors at 49%. I think transportation is one 
not always how it's paid for is agreed on, but a lot of times those projects and infrastructure projects mm-hmm. are something that are a little bit more commonly um, agreed upon the spectrum. Mm-hmm. But the second one that had the majority highest proportion of bills with minority chief authors was the taxes committee at 37. Yeah. And I think that we look often look at taxes or anything financial when it comes to the political world as one of those kind of fringes or, or, you know, more sides, they they just have very different agreements on what our taxes should look like, what they should be spent on, how they should be brought in. Um, So that was something that I, I was surprising to me. And, and maybe that is largely because of someone like Senator Ann Rest, who at the helm, you know, did try to foster that. So it's very possible that that itself played a role. So I, I appreciate that anecdote. I didn't I didn't know that that was one of her roles. But yeah. um, and I guess I'm going to go a, a little off track before I come back to my question about the study. But and this might not be something, you know, yet, and it might be something that after a couple of years would be able to look at a little bit better. But um you know, Senator Rest has has been around for quite a while. I think yes. I, I was just looking it up. She was first elected to the House in 1984 and has served in the House for a number of terms before moving over to the Senate. Do you, does that surprise you that it was a, a chair that has been around as long as um, Senator Rest, or is that something? For me, that makes a little bit more sense because she's seen how the benefits of bipartisanship can truly move the needle and, and, you know, make things better for Minnesotans and not necessarily as bought into this newer age of division. Yeah, absolutely. I do think that has something to do with it. Um, it has to do with, and I'm, I'm, I haven't, I haven't had this particular conversation with her, so I'm just guessing. <laughs> um, but uh, I assume just having been around and experienced being in the majority and experienced being in the minority and knowing how that, that feels, um, I think, you know, she, Senator Ress got nothing to prove to anybody. <laughs> I mean, the woman's got like two PhDs and has been in the Senate, like you said, for a long time and her legacy is intact. Um, so I think, you know, she is not in a position where she really sort of needs to make a splash, um, or needs to check a box for, for her party. Um, she just, she gets her work done and she's, she's really, um, interested in engaging in those conversations um, because she's still, she's open to learning new stuff. Um, I think some of the challenge uh, comes from, so like there were, when we started this session, there were 86 members of the 201 person legislator, 86 people were new to their role. So like we had some house members that moved to the Senate and there was one person moved to the Senate to the house, but those people plus new members 86 of them were new and that's an enormous class. And so you have those people who are just trying to have, you know, form relationships on their own side of the aisle, let alone across the aisle. But then you also had the COVID class the years before. So anybody who started in 2021 and, and yeah, elected in 2020, started in 2021, 2022, like they had very limited interaction in person. Like this was really the first year that the legislature was like back in person all the time. So they didn't have the opportunity to make those those relationships. So on, in that way, they were sort of like freshman 2.0 um, or something in 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 their uh, in their legislative experience. Well, I appreciate you guys doing the report. I am very interested to see how it comes down this year and any changes, um, it being an election year that it might have. You know, yeah. we certainly, as you just mentioned. Um, relationships in person are certainly extremely crucial in, in kind of building this uh, bridge across the aisle to mm-hmm. have that willingness to work. We've we had Senator Benson on and she she mentioned a number of folks on the other side of the aisle that were some of her closest friends and, and folks yeah. she still keeps up with because you have that ability to push that stuff aside and really build those relationships. So hopefully now post COVID, you know, we're really getting into that and we'll see more. Um, but it being an election year and endorsements just being around the corner well, well, only time will tell what really comes. But I, I think as this gets built on year after year, it'll be really interesting to see how things evolve and change and keep pushing forward. Yeah. And in defense of the House, like, you know, they're twice as big as the Senate. And they've got some structural things that I think make it a little, uh, not quite as easy to to form those relationships. Uh, so like the committee seating in the Senate, it it's not, you know, these people sit on this side and those are the people Mm -hmm. sit on the other side. Um, so I love, I love committee hearings in the Senate because I can go through and watch, you know, Eric Pratt and, um, 
uh, Aaron Murphy, like talking about something or Cal Barr and Lindsay Port uh, giggling during elections committee. Like that was my favorite of the whole session. Like, you know, if those two can come together, we should be able to figure this out. Let's not forget, though, that the house, you can also wear jeans in the house, which is just, <laughs> just an abomination. So let's just be clear there. <laughs> is that is that a pro house vote there? Michael? That's that's anti. I'm oh, okay. saying, well, yes, yes. The uh, house has a number of uh, yes. So they, Mike, I think they can wear jeans. Uh, so that's just yes, just yeah. just drives me crazy. <laughs> um, Michael and I both worked for the Senate. Uh, we left yes. crossed over in timing too. Uh, another change over there. My friends who worked for House members often call them by their first name. I still will occasionally text uh-huh. with the senator I work for, and he's still senator or sir, even though he's now retired. So you know, there's yep. definitely difference in those chambers. But to your point, I, my, my member I worked for, Senator Bill Ingerbritson from Alexandria, he mm-hmm. was the chair of the Environment Committee. And because they did every other, even as staff, I sat next to Senator Linda Higgins, who Demo- was yeah. a Democrat from Minneapolis and loved her. We got along great, um, still communicate on, on social media every once in a while. But it is you know just sitting next to somebody and it really breaks down those walls a little bit. So I yeah. um, want to get into one last thing with you before we go. Um Majority in the Middle is hosting Silly Questions Saturday. Um, It's at the Minnesota State Capitol, February 3rd from 1030 to noon. Tell us a little bit about this and why this is an event that you are putting on. Yeah, so um, I uh, frequently spend a lot of time if I'm at the Capitol um, looking for people who are lost (laughs) because it's not hard to find them. Um, There's a lot of people. The, The Capitol itself, as you guys know, it's big. It's confusing. Um, particularly if you get into the basement, uh, you don't know which way you're going and it's really easy to get turned around. Um, and the directions don't seem to make a lot of sense. So there's those people. And then there's also people who get lost by the process. And as the, you know, government is for and by the people and the state capital is the people's house. I want people to feel as, as comfortable there as they want to feel. And, uh, so, it, you know, try to get across the intimidation factor um, during session, like that's an extra hurdle. And so we decided like, okay, let's go to the Capitol on a Saturday and everybody can wear jeans, Michael, not just the house member. Everybody can wear jeans. That's fine. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like we're getting caught up in this, this committee has to get out of this room at this time, whatever. So it's going to be on Saturday, it's going to be casual. And then we can talk about things in the building that um, are confusing and we can talk about part of the process that's confusing and just ask everybody silly question. And, you know, we, we call them the silly, we call it silly question Saturday because a lot of times people will think their question is too silly to ask out loud. And we guarantee you, if you have that question, somebody else has that question too. And so this is an opportunity for all the silly questions. Um, so we're, we're really looking forward to it. We want to thank you for participating in this interview today. I can't tell you how much um, this is a little bit of a palate cleanser for some of the partisanship <laughs> that's going on right now. We've been awesome. doing some deep dives into the race for president, and uh, yeah. we've been doing a great job in that. But this is where our heart and soul is on mm-hmm. kind of partisanship. And it's really a perfect match for the message that we're trying to do on the podcast. And I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing. We're going to send as much attention as we can your way. And we also want you to know that if there's ever a, a subject matter you want to come back on and discuss, we hope we can have you come back on again and talk about your organization and promote an event or do whatever, because this is uh, something that you talked about is something that Becky and I believe very strongly, which is elevating those who are uh, doing the right yeah. thing. And, and that's who we try to have on this podcast. And it's one, of, it's the absolute reason why we wanted to have you on. We're not trying to bring people on to have conflict and, and, and animosity back and forth. We're trying to elevate voices that we think need to be elevated. We want to have uh, on to help elevate their voice. So just thank you for, being a voice of just bipartisanship, working together in the middle and doing some good things. I will say we have used Jeff Kolb as a guest host occasionally. Jeff knew you were coming on and he said, I was very surprised by this. He said he was a fan of Majority in the Middle. <laughs> yeah. So he's given money and it just goes, I kind of view Jeff as like Archie Bunker sometimes just because cantankerous kind of guy. But I was surprised and I just wanted to note that he was a big fan and I wanted to say kudos for what you're doing too. I was surprised because Jeff is, Jeff can be just a little rough sometimes. Um, you know, Jeff can be rough. Um, and, and I adore Jeff because um, he does say the quiet part out loud. He does. A lot. Oh, and he, yes, he's given many. He has been part of our um, our local elected officials advisory group. We have a we have what is almost a support group for people who are or have been in local elected office. 
Um, and really talking about the the sort of experience of being in elected office and what that means. And I mean, you guys have talked about that with the protests, the homes and all the things. Um, so so the like I I I welcome the, his candor and yeah. I love the podcast, so I'm very happy to be on. So thank I you. I sometimes don't welcome his candor because he's very <laughs> rough with me, uh, but uh, I can see how others do. I would appreciate that. But just thank you again in all seriousness for what you're Absolutely. doing and for taking the time to come on and being a guest and the work that you're doing. And uh, just want to say just one note. I've seen a lot of reports at the legislature. A lot of things get my attention. This report literally stopped me dead in my tracks. And the way it was presented, the way it was done, just A-plus work that you're oh, doing. Oh, thank you so much. And, and keep it up. And I hope you keep doing it every year. Yeah, we're going to try. And just to echo, Michael, we're, we're really grateful. This is, you know, we're always just trying to have good civil conversations yeah. and expose people to things they might not already otherwise be exposed to. So we're grateful for you and the work you're doing, because while we are talking a lot, it's good to have folks putting this action together and moving the ball forward in this area. Um, where can folks find you, find Majority in the Middle, website, social handles? Uh, find out more, register. I know this event on the 3rd, uh, you're asking folks to register. So tell us all your things. Yes. Okay. So the uh, the the website is majoritymiddle.com. Um, so the state of bipartisanship report is, a, is at the top of the page. The events are also at the top of the page. That's where you would register for Silly Question Saturday. Um, and yeah, all of our social handles are on the bottom. We are on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Threads, YouTube, Instagram. We're not always great on all of those platforms, but there's a lot of platforms. So we And try. where can folks follow you, Shannon? I know you're on, on Twitter yourself. On Twitter, I'm Shannon K. Watson. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, good luck this session. Thanks so much. And Becky, we just interviewed uh, Shannon Watson, Executive Director of Majority in the Middle. Your take. As you said, it was a perfect palate cleanser. You know, it's it's been tough to kind of spend so much time invested in the Republican presidential primary and all of the vitriol between the candidates from the left, from, you know, the candidates outwards. It's It's been tough and tiring and we're just getting started. Um, so that's not going to change. But to, to have uh, Shannon on to discuss her work in that middle talking to people who feel a little disenfranchised, who feel left out, who are looking for, you know, again, they're, they're folks like you, politically homeless at this time, kind of looking for that home, looking for a place to maybe put some time, energy, conversation. Um, and Majority in the Middle appears to be doing that. It's, you know, they I like that they're holding events, they're educating folks, working with the chambers. It's really exciting. And um, it will be great to see this report done year after year as as long as they're able to um to see how years come compare to each other and if it has impact you know are we going to start working towards where folks are able to cherish and lift up their bipartisan work a little bit more than recent history yes i was almost therapeutic to have her on the part level of partisanship it was great to have her on have a discussion we wanted to have her on for a while and the timing of it worked out great she's doing some absolutely fantastic work 315 page report that is pretty close to rivaling your level of nerdum <laughs> and so it was just great and i just was she said so many things that resonated with me about discussions and having those conversations and having talking with people of, of both sides i think is so incredibly important and it's something that we believe very strongly in so it was a natural to have her on and i hope we have her on again i just I couldn't be more of an advocate for that message that she's pushing right now and the work that her organization is doing. And they're turning out some very meaty things. That report on bipartisanship is impressive. It's very impressive in terms of the quality and the amount of work that went in. And this silly question Saturday, that's just the kind of unique hook to get people engaged in the process. And she's really thinking outside of the box while working in the box on some of these things. And it's a real good leadership model. And I'm glad we had her on and I'm, and I'm glad we made time for that discussion and hope to have her on again. Absolutely. Now let's turn things um, back here, Minnesota presidential primary. Um, while we're kind of chatting a lot about Iowa, New Hampshire, and New Hampshire's tomorrow, 
So as, as this comes out, people are going to be getting ready to vote there in New Hampshire. Um, here in Minnesota, presidential primary is not until March 5th. However, early voting has opened. January 19th, that began. A uh, couple comments. You can go to pollfinder.sos.mn.gov to find out where you vote in person, day of, or early. Um, you can also request an absentee ballot. One comment I did want to make is um, the candidates for these ballots are submitted by the political parties uh, 63 days before the primary. So uh, both Republican DFL Party and Legalize Marijuana Now submitted the names of folks who will be on their respective um, ballots on January 2nd. And so any candidate that drops out between January 2nd and March 5th will still be on that ballot. So for the Republicans, we have Chris Christie, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Donald Trump on our ballot. Democrats have about nine um, folks on there. Obviously, the notables, Joe Biden, Dean Phillips, Marianne Williams, among others. There are also uh, five candidates on the legalized marijuana now because they do have major party status. So it is just those three parties that have major party status. Um, and just as a reminder, in 2020, uh, the Republican Party, who I was working there at the time, did only put Donald Trump on the ballot. So despite others running in that race and being technically in that race at the time. So this is a change. There are those five on the ballot. Um, but go find your place to vote. Great. Let's encourage people to vote. That's a great thing. Always. Always, always. Um, all right. You want to get into the the next saga? I'd like, I think it's fair to say, based on what I've learned, more about this subject than I do. So I'd like you, and I didn't know that coming in. I didn't know yeah. that coming in. But I'd like you to kick it off, and then I'll chime in. All right. So we're just going to break down a little bit of the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey saga. Now the saga is not, drama is not surrounding their relationship with each other, but the general public's take. You know, we've seen since Taylor Swift has started going to support her husband or her boyfriend at his football games, you know, God forbid, folks have been really up in arms. Football, fo fo football fans have really kind of just been irritated by the fact that she's there, that she's getting attention as though she is the one that chooses to do this. The NFL leaned all in. They did a bunch of TikToks and Instagram posts and, and the like, um, promoting Taylor Swift being in all of the games. All sorts of people jumped all over this. Pretty much all the people but Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, they're in a relationship. She is supporting her boyfriend. Um, and that's kind of the done deal. But as our good friend T. Swift says, haters going to hate. And haters have been hating. So we've seen um, there was somebody just this last week. So we saw Jason Kelsey is no longer in the um, running for the Super Bowl. He was supporting his brother as well in the suite with Taylor Swift this last weekend. Jason Kelsey is a pretty um, big uh, goofball, it seems, when it comes. So he was sitting there with his shirt off, rocking out. There was a tweet that you shared with me that said, if you think Jason Kelsey is going bonkers at the football game is cool, but are annoyed by Taylor Swift cheering, you might just hate women. And, you know, it's an interesting take. What's your thought on, the, on, that, on that message? First of all, let me say this. I've gone to a Taylor Swift concert. I went with my kids to a Taylor Swift concert, and it was fantastic. They enjoyed it. I think this is ridiculous. The level of vitriol that she's getting <laughs> for going to a sporting event. First of all, let's identify the successes of Taylor Swift. She is, without a doubt, the most significant artist across a variety of platforms I mean, that in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that she's going to an NFL game in any capacity is a great branding opportunity for the NFL. But the fact that she's going to these games is wonderful. It's wonderful for the league. It's bringing in a new interest of the league into the NFL. It's fantastic. I cannot, for the life of me, understand why people get so upset about Taylor Swift going to NFL games. Now, that being said, the only frustration I have, and I want to be very respectful about saying this because I don't want a bunch of Swifties after me, I wish she would have come to Minnesota. The Kansas Agreed. City Chiefs did play in Minnesota, and I didn't go that game. My, sister's, my sister was going to go that My sister went that game. Expectation was that Taylor Swift was there. And I'm a supportive of Taylor Swift going to as many sporting events that she right. wants to go to. I just feel a little slighted here that she didn't come to U.S. Bank when the Vikings played the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, that being said, I cannot fathom why someone goes out on social media and picks fights and gets, this is the hill they want to die on. Yeah. The, the level of vitriol that comes in, and it happens all the time. I think it is fantastic. I think it's just fantastic. And it, it, it's, it's entertaining to the game. They're bringing a new element to the game. 
this dynamic that played out on Sunday was just fabulous. And I do not understand why someone would go and want to go pick a fight with Taylor Swift and their fan base by being upset that she's at an NFL game. I mean, especially because, I mean, first of all, you're right. It's so many new eyes on this and so much more interest in these games because of the Swifties that have kind of come on board with this. Um, But it's also not, you know, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, it's not like she's also putting out the fans, right? It's not like she's showing up to these games and they're shutting down huge exits and she's making a big scene and she's disrupting and games are delayed or anything of that sort. She is showing up, walking through, you know, the tunnels, going up to the suite, sitting with the Kelsey mama and friends and family. And watching the game, you don't have to turn around. You don't have to be disrupted by her. She is not impacting any part of the game whatsoever. Watch your game and let T Swift do her thing. May I ask you? Because the reason why I retweeted this was because I it just was pretty clear to me that it was Kayla Knapp that tweeted out. If you take, if you think Jason Kelsey going bonkers at a football game is cool, but are annoyed by Taylor Swift cheering, you might just hate women. I, and a part of me thinks that's what it is. Is that fair? A hundred percent. I mean, if you think of, you know, football tends to be, we look at it mostly as like a male dominated fan base, right? Well, particularly so, this year, because I won the breakdown with Rock Rocker Rebecca's of course. first pick'em league. Of course. Um, but if you think of all of these different celebrities that go to the games, right? Like you have Will Ferrell, who is a big, you know, fan, and you have Ryan Reynolds and all of these different folks, they're shown on the screen. If they're, you know, if they're at a game, I was at a Vikings game and the the Minnesotan woman who was recently at The Bachelorette, she was there. She was shown on the screen. Again, they're not the ones that are saying, hey, please put me on the screen 17 times a, a game. But that same attention, if it's going to be Brad Pitt, who's showing up every game of, you know, Boston Red Sox, he's going to be shown on the screen every time as well. Why is it so up in arms that it's this woman, again, sitting in the suite? And it's it, it, it's just, it's wild. It's stupid. If it was, again, a male celebrity who was just sitting up there and attending every single game for their person or for their team that they support, nobody gets up in arms about it. Yeah, I saw Tara Reid at the Vikings game last year. Um, she was at a Vikings game, which was totally random. Yeah, uh, But I, I, part of this is just I don't understand. I mean, I don't know what she's doing wrong. And, and I guess, and I, and I hate to sound so ignorant, but I guess I need someone to explain to me what she's doing wrong that she's getting this animated. Yeah. She's getting this much animosity about her. She's absolutely living my dream. She's absolutely, she's going to NFL games. She's getting in suites. And yeah. she's cheering for a successful team. She's living my dream. Why would I go uh, out there and be critical? Is it just, please help me understand this. Is it just angry men? Is that what I, this is? Yeah. I mean, it's just something they want to roll their eyes. How dare you, you know, take something away from us focusing on the plays or the people or the sports. It is what it is. It's just ridiculous. I, even at last, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, there was a video of the the Kelsey box or the box that Swift was in with um, Travis Kelsey's friends and family. And they were kind of swaying side to side and, and dancing and like going, getting really into it with a crowd below them. And everybody's like, oh my God, Taylor Swift, you know, doing a, you know, synchronized um, little dance here. Well, then somebody posted the other side of it. The cheerleaders mm-hmm. were down on the field doing that, trying to get the crowd to do this. She was one of like a million people in this, you know, stadium that was doing it. But like, oh, no, God, she's such a disruptor. They're trying to get the fans excited. She's doing that. Again, it's my only criticism. <laughs> no, that's great. My only criticism of Taylor Swift, I'm going to be very respectful of this because I, I don't want I, I, I've told people before uh, there's I'm on a, a chat with some neighbors and we talk about the Taylor Swift dynamic at sports uh, quite a bit and the last i'm gonna tell you the most powerful mobilized army in the world right now is taylor swift and her fan base and so i do not want to get them agitated i wish she would have come to minnesota same i wish she would have come to minnesota again but let me just point something out to you i have twin daughters and i take them to been taking them to nfl games and i want them to be excited to go to to appreciate an nfl game and appreciate that environment take all my kids to the game and so i just i guess i'm just disappointed because I've come to the realization that the reason that the animosity is towards her is because she's a woman. And it just frustrates me. That's where we're at. Mm-hmm. It's not anything more than that. We have people talking about how we have to root against Kansas City. We have to stop Kansas City from getting to the Super Bowl because of the Taylor Swift dynamic. I just think that's horrible. Ridiculous. Because I'm at a loss to figure out what she's doing wrong. 
other than living my dream, which is going to NFL stadiums all across the world, all across the country, sitting in boxes and cheering for a successful team, other than her living my dream, I don't know what she's doing wrong. And I'm just trying to figure out, and I guess I just needed to to just to cleanse myself a little bit of just coming to the realization that this is just about men being upset that a, a woman is excited at a sporting event. Absolutely. Last thing I'm going to say on the subject is if you haven't seen any of the videos, now this is about a month or so old, but it was one of the best things when she first started dating Kelsey and this, um, a lot of folks, you know, women be in particular or Swifties um, started to start figuring this out. A lot of women were taping themselves, having conversations with their partner, their husband, their boyfriend, or their friend, you know, saying, do you, did you know that Travis or Taylor Swift is dating this football guy? You know, she's really putting this Travis Kelsey on a map and watching the guy's head swivel. Like she's putting him on the map. You know, he's a two time Super Bowl <laughs> champion. What's going on? And it was just funny watching, you know, they're just baiting their partner into having some reaction, but it is so funny because to these Swifties, a lot of them are like, Oh, she's just dating some football player who's very famous in his own accord. Um, I love it. I think it's cute. I think it's sweet. I think they seem into each other. You know, Taylor Swift is is in her own realm of life and uh, let the girl do her. That's right. The only one last point I'll make, again, just to put a finer point in, she went to Green Bay, but she didn't come to Minnesota. <laughs> so I'm just... I'll hey, call her up and let her know you're disappointed. Hey, Taylor Swift and your entire fan base, you're welcome in Minnesota. We'll be respectful. We are ready. I mean, just be fantastic. I would. That's That's my only knock on this whole thing is that she went to Green Bay but she didn't come to U.S. Bank. And U.S. Bank is a great stadium. It sure is. I would have cheered her on. Yeah. All right, Becky, thanks for clearing this up. And <laughs> based on the reaction, um, we need to start delving into more Taylor Swift and this type of entertainment uh, subject. It seems, maybe it's, a, it's our new bit. Maybe it's our new bit. Well, <laughs> Becky, thank you again. You did a bang-up job. Thank you. We'll chat soon. Yeah, bye. We want to thank you for listening to The Breakdown with Broad Corbin Becky. Before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on the platform where you listen. You can leave a review or give us a shout out on our website or across all social media platforms at at BB Breakpod. The Breakdown with Broadcore and Becky will return next week. Thank you again for listening.